Today we're going to return to the basics, which isn't uh, actually a return at all, but uh, an empowerment or an upliftment. Usually around here we try to practice uh, an outlook of beginner's mind, of seeing the word repeat as a dirty word. Repeat assumes that you know something. Repeat allows you to dismiss, to cut off learning, cut off growth, to start to stagnate, which in Chinese medicine is all illness. This morning we chanted the Prajna Paramita Sutra. Prajna is the Sanskrit word for wisdom. And pra means before, and nya is knowledge. So wisdom is that which is before knowledge, which is often translated as the beginner's mind. The beginner's mind is open, receptive, most importantly, humble. So I encourage you to install a technology in your mind that whenever your ego starts to raise that voice of, I know this, that another flag comes up, that actually this is a time to listen even more. Because, number one, we are creatures who learn from repetition. If you want to learn Chinese, for example, you have to repeat the word again and again and again. We have to repeat lessons. And so if a lesson is returning to your life, it's an opportunity to renew your contract with that lesson. It's obviously returning for a reason. And in that way, you also refine it. You go deeper. Advanced techniques are basic techniques mastered. Advanced techniques are not embellished and grandized, complicated, complex techniques. They are basic techniques mastered. So in light of that, there is no real basic the foundation is what we build everything upon. And its strength is the strength of the whole building, even the 50th floor rests ultimately on the foundation. So when I think I know something, when that voice comes up that says, oh, I know this, then I have another technology that comes up and says, no, no, usually often, not always, but often, what the ego is resisting, what the ego is trying to dismiss is actually my medicine. And it's bitter because it's my medicine. Recently in Australia, after this event, you know, I tell a lot of stories in my teaching. We had this workshop for a few hours and afterwards this elderly lady came up to me and said, Oh, I'm so glad you love stories. I love stories too. And I want to share a story with you. And she started telling this story that not only have I heard it many times, but I've also told it myself many times. And so of course that, and she started telling it very slowly. So of course that annoyed voice came up and said, ah, I know this story. And for me, even more dangerous because not only know something, but to be empowered to teach it is another barrier between the, the, the learning. And then, of course, that technology came up and I said, no, 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 to let go. I let go of that egoic voice that was saying, um, you know, I know this story. I've heard this many times. I let go of that voice. I exhaled it and I breathed in deeply and I let go and I became humble and a beginner. And actually, she told the story quite beautifully, number one. Number two, she told it in a way I've never heard it. And number three, her version highlighted something that I didn't ever really think about to do with that story. So actually that story I had thought had only a single lesson in it, but it actually had at least two. And I found a second lesson in the, in the story, just in the way that she told it, which was different than um, the way that I told it. So this is an example of just keeping this beginner's mind, which relates a lot to what we're going to talk about today. Um, which is that the, the kind of fundamentals of working with tea as plant medicine, as a vehicle of self-cultivation, of healing, 
and of uh, Tao. And uh, it, relates to the, it will relate to the same theme of uh, cultivating this wise beginner's mind, this mind that is humble and receptive, which uh, expands as a lesson and unpacks and unfolds and opens. <clears throat> so the most important place to start, I think, in working with uh, any plant medicine, this one in particular, um, is, is that plant medicine requires participation. This is important, it's very important. Plant medicine requires participation. If you want a substance, a chemical, that goes into your body and causes some objective change that has been studied with double blinds and it doesn't matter about your outlook or how much you participate, the chemical just does that to you, then I suggest you pursue Western medicine because that's its forte. The entire structure, design and modality of Western medicine is built upon that scientific method. And that's what it has going for it. That's its... Uh, that's its power. And so sometimes that has power. I don't dismiss that. I'm not opposed to science. I, do, I believe that Zen is science and the Buddhist teaching is also a science. But that's, the mod that's that modality of healing. And that's what it does best. And, and so if you want that, you should seek healing in that modality because plant medicine does not work that way. When you go into the supermarket and there's 10 kinds of shampoo and one of them says now with ginkgo extract, that doesn't mean anything. It has the same chemicals in it as the other nine kinds of shampoo and the ginkgo doesn't do anything. There is a gray area where we can take chemicals that are extracted or derivatives of plants and they can come into the Western modality. So it's not to dismiss that. That can happen. Right? But plant medicine doesn't work that way. And that's why when you pick, when you go to the store in America and you buy any kind of plant medicine, it says right on the back, this is not meant to treat any disease. This does nothing. The FDA has no proof that this does anything. And it has that whole spiel about how this doesn't do anything. It's not meant to treat or cure or prevent any disease. It, da, 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 it has that whole clause there. The reason is because the scientific findings are inconclusive and inconsistent. There are, you can't approach it that way. It doesn't function that way. When you approach it with this modality, you get inconsistent, inconclusive results to the point that the FDA can't approve it, any of it. Because plant medicine requires participation. It requires the heart of the person needs to be involved. Um, I think that we've seen a shift in traditional medicines, shamanic medicines and plant-based medicines to try to be more Western. Chinese doctors wearing white coats and talking about herbs as though they're science, I, I feel like there's a great loss there. And I feel like that shift comes out of marketing. It comes out of this kind of medicine becoming predominant in the world. And so these people, if they wanna make a living, have to adapt and take some steps towards this. But I feel like all those steps are steps away from their power. Because as you study now, you don't actually the Chinese doctor now, he doesn't actually go into the mountains and, and talk to the plant. He doesn't, he doesn't learn how to pick the roots himself and dry them. He learns how to buy industrial produced herbs, roots and herbs that have been ground into powders in some factory with people in lab coats and how to mix them together like this. And I think a, a lot, not all, but a lot of the efficacy and power is lost in that. That you're taking steps away from what plant medicine is about because plant medicine is about that trip to the mountains. It's about digging that plant up. It's about learning how to dry it. It's about learning how to grind it. And it's about talking to it through that whole process. 
So this is, is where our talk comes full circle back to this uh, beginner's mind, back to this, um, this Zen. I think that um, in o- part of this participation, a big part of this participation, plant medicine requires participation, a big part of this participation is a change in a shift in worldview. And I don't think that this shift in worldview is just about plant medicine. I think that for me anyway, this shift of, in worldview is itself healing. And in part, it's itself healing because it is more in concordance with truth, with reality. So I, I think that no matter what your modality of healing is and whether you want to participate in plant medicine or not, this shift in worldview is, a, is still itself a healing step because not all of our sickness is physical. Some of it is wrong views, delusions of the mind or, or the spirit, including this idea that we should come compartmentalize our healing into body and mind and spirit. Body for the doctor, mind for the psychologist, spirit for the temple or church. This itself is, is also a, a way of thinking that is itself a sickness. Because actually we are a single being. Have you ever had a cold where you sat there for the entire three days of the cold in perfect bliss and the cold did not affect your mind or spirit at all? Of course not. So there is no such thing as a purely physical illness. It comes out of the spirit and mind. It goes into the spirit and mind. They're all connected. It's one system. It's all one one system. It's a one one being. It's not separate beings. So <clears throat> the shift in worldview that I'm talking about is is to do with this beginner's mind because it's to do with a kind of openness. I think that a lot of people travel, and when I say travel, I mean travel on a trip to some other land, but I also mean travel on this planet, with this mixed up idea that that I go to China and bounce around in China and come out. And that's an unconscious view that we carry with us, that I'm going over there to China, I'm going to move around in China a bit. And then I'm going to come out. Or that you've come to Taiwan and you're going to move around in Taiwan a little bit and leave. Right? Which is, as I said, not only is it inimical to, to practicing plant medicine, but I think it's, it's a view that hinders our ability to live fully and freely because it's not in concordance with reality. The fact is, if you come to Taiwan within a few days, you're breathing Taiwan air you're eating food that was grown in Taiwan soil. The Taiwan uh, energy and atmosphere is all in you. You are Taiwan. If somebody in China points at Taiwan and says, over there's Taiwan, they're pointing at you. You are this place. And to the extent that you are the place, that you open to it, is to the extent that it will transform you and change you. If you take a trip where you go to China and bounce around in there and leave, that trip won't change you very much. If you take a trip where you go and become that place, then that trip will change you a lot. And that goes for a relationship with anything, any so-called thing or person, right? If I meet my new sister here and I stay over here and I keep her over there, then this relationship is not going to affect me. It's not going to change me. If I open my heart and I, and I get to know her and I let her in, I let her ideas and her way of life and her perspectives, and her wisdom that she's cultivated in her time on this planet, if I allow that to come in, I will be changed by this relationship. If I don't, I won't. And that goes for every relationship that we have with any, anything or person. When we open ourselves and we let it in, then it changes us. But we have to let it in. And to let it in, we have to have an empty bowl, right? It's like this could be, we could talk about this in in terms of teacher and student as well, right? Teacher is just a role I play. Zen itself, the first foundation of Zen is direct nonverbal transmission between teacher and student. Direct nonverbal transmission between teacher and student. If you're not open and you're not playing the role of student, then I'm 
not playing the role of teacher. Then we're just dudes bouncing against each other. And the, that transmission is not happening because you're, you're, not, you're not there with an empty pole. If you're there with an empty pole, then it, which is not me, but it, the Zen, the lineage, flows through me and into your bowl. This is why before we learn to make tea, we have to learn how to drink tea. We learn to take it in from, not just from the teacher and the tradition, but also from nature and from the place where she comes from. So it has to, it has to come in. If your view of the world is this way, you will stay stuck as opposed to growing. You will stay defined as opposed to limitless. You will stay small as opposed to large. You will not recognize that the absolute fact of the matter is that you are your environment. You are it. This is not a substance that goes into my body and moves around in there and leaves. This is me. This is the energy flow of myself. There's no such thing as cha chi. People talk about the chi of tea. Tea doesn't, it's not, there's not a tea of chi. It's just chi. Because the moment I take it in, it's me. It's me that's moving. It's not a substance moving around in my body that I'm then uh, urinating out. Right? This idea of food comes from that same ill worldview. This unconscious idea that is conditioned into you, that you have, that you take something and you put it in your mouth and you chew on this substance, this matter, and the matter goes down in, into your stomach and gets broken up and becomes the matter of your body. This is an antiquated view of the world. In the 19th century, they developed this predominant mechanistic view of the world that is built on mechanical laws and is based on the idea that the universe is made of matter, of objects that are predominantly unintelligent, stupid bowls, stupid table, stupid kettle, and intelligence exists within the bag of human skin. But then even our science transcended this. See, we're quantum now. We know that E equals MC squared. There's no matter. It's all energy. We know that, just like we knew it a long time ago. But the fact is, a lot of people, including probably yourself, your common sense has not caught up. Your day-to-day -day mind is still walking around in a world of objects. Stupid objects. Matter. Matter that you chew on. Matter that becomes the matter of you. But that's not how it works. This is a bioluminescent dance of energy. It's not a substance coming into my body. It's an energy. It's the energy of the sun. It's the energy of the minerals of the, of the earth. It's the energy of water. The water in this tea that we were just drinking was literally, scientifically, within a cloud less than two weeks ago. You're drinking the clouds. You are the clouds. You are the minerals of the world. You are the sun. These atoms of my body, they were all star energy. It's all vibrating. It's all moving. It's all coming into me. And our ancestors all knew this. No Native American came home with a deer and threw it on the ground and said to his wife and kids, hey, get some of that stuff. It's good stuff. They didn't speak that way. In the plains, anyway, the verb for a kill is literally a giveaway. So the brave would have come home and set the animal down gently on the ground, and he would say to his wife, a deer gave way to us today. Gave way what? Life. They put life in their mouth. They chewed on life. Life flowed through them as energy. You know, every agricultural society in the world, independent of each other, they all have the same story. God comes down and is killed and cut up into pieces and put in the ground and out of his body comes the staple crop of that civilization. Corn in the Americas, wheat in, in the Middle East, rice in China. Everywhere there's the same story which is a story of the sustenance coming out of the transcendent, out of the divine, out of the body of God. That this is what we are eating. 
We're eating the stars. That's the beauty of the plant medicine. They're deeply rooted and connected to the earth, but they're also connected to what's out there because they take in the sun. And they are our source in a big way and a little way. In a big way because all life on this planet evolved out of plants. And in a little way because all of the energy that motivates your body on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're vegetarian or not, all of the energy that motivates you is plant energy. It's all plant. This is why, interestingly, in the place where tea comes from, Yunnan, all the aboriginal tribes, every single aboriginal tribe believes they are descended from tea. One that I know of, the Da'ang, they believe all life on earth is descended from tea. And so if you understand this, that the plant kingdom is the source, then you understand the meaning of, of that mythology. That they're saying that we come from this plant kingdom, we evolved out of it, and it also motivates our body because it's the impetus for every movement we make. So, we are as constricted or as large as we define ourselves. The definition of you in space is arbitrary. Are you a being who exists three inches behind your eyes and manipulates the controls of this body as you sit right here in this little dullest tower? Are you this body? Am I the sun? You better believe I'm the sun. I'm the trees. Where'd that breath you just took come from? From trees. The trees are as essential to my survival as any of the organs in my body. No air and I'm gone. So, I'm as big or as small as I want to be. And I let it in and it transforms me. So there's this old Chinese saying, right? All that is not me is my master. If I'm showing up with an empty bowl, then it's going to fill me. And I can drink that bowl and the energy flows and my bowl's empty again and I'm ready. This is the beginner's mind. And this is how I grow. And this is not just how I grow, but how I stay connected to life as it's happening in this moment. How I stay alive and open and free. And stop seeing the world as objects. And stop seeing others so much as others. That's a practice. Let go of the objects and return to the state where it's all energy. Because it is. It's alive. And if you're not capable of doing that, of living your whole day in a state of energy, right? Then you'll need a practice. You'll need a healing practice that restores that true outlook to you. That true outlook has been restored to me. Not through any supernatural power. Through a practice. Decades of a practice. And so I give that practice to you and you can practice that and restore that outlook. And that practice is simply, I recognize that my capacity is thus. I recognize that I am constitutionally incapable at this point of seeing the whole world as energy. That's not my natural state right now. But what I can do is draw a line around this one activity. And everything that I do in this circle, I do in, in that state. I relate in that state. I show up with that intention, with an open heart, with a receptive heart, allowing things to come in, allowing things to be alive and be energy again. My teapots, my bowls, tea itself the way that I relate to this space. And from there, that starts to, the practice starts to spread to other areas of your life, right? It starts to spread. You start to see things as, as alive again. Because, see, the real fact of the matter is, you don't need to rely on my experience to recognize, acknowledge, and celebrate the truth of what I'm saying. You can go to your own experience. Because I ask you right now, sister, remember with all your heart, wasn't it all alive when you were little? Did you have stuffed animals? Did you have toys? Didn't they have names? You can go up to any four-year-old kid and say to them, go say hello to that stone. And without any hesitation, they'll walk over to the stone and say, hello, Mr. Stone. It was all alive for you. What happened? When did it die? When did the wonder go away? And is that a good thing? You decide those questions. They're rhetorical. For me, 
if you want to know, the place where it died is, is, was when I went to school. Sadly, going to school was where I lost the sense of wonder. Also, paradoxically, going to school was where I lost my love of learning, which makes absolutely no sense, but it's true. I lost my love of learning at school. I should have a t-shirt. I lost my love of learning at school. That's the sad thing. But I've taken it back because that wasn't a good death. That wasn't a good end. There is this poison that has crept in through the back door of our science, which is that if we understand and have the power to explain something, we have the power to dismiss its magic, its awe, its wonder. But actually that dismissal is, has nothing to do with the scientific method. Einstein himself said, if, you, if, if a scientist is not looking on with awe, he's either not practicing science or he's not looking. So having an explanation for, for a phenomenon does not dismiss it. Nowhere in the scientific method is there an inherent conclusion that I can explain it, therefore it's dismissible, or it's not wonderful, or it's not magic, or it's not awesome, right? I can explain the aurora borealis. I can explain it. It's caused by the, the electromagnetics of the Earth. It's caused by the electromagnetics of the North and South Pole. There's a, there's a, a disturbance in the atmosphere caused by that electromagnetic radiation that creates lights in the sky. That explanation, which is a summary and limited here, but you know, with a little bit of research and remembering my geology class, I could give you a more detailed explanation as well. But that explanation, nowhere within it, is contained the conclusion that therefore, the aurora borealis is not beautiful, magical, wonderful, awesome. That it's an electro, a meteorological phenomenon, an electromagnetic phenomenon, doesn't make it any less wonderful. The fact is we're, we're sitting right now on a giant hollow blue ball whizzing through space at thousands of kilometers the hour. And there's electromagnetic currents all around this giant blue ball that are causing this magic array of lights in, in the sky. What about that is not awesome? What about that is not wonderful? What about that is not amazing? Why is that something to be dismissed? Why not let it in? Why me over here and it over there? Why not realize that it's all up in my eyes? It's all up in my spirit. It's all up in my soul. That's, the, that's the, what William Blake called the golden threads. The golden threads are coming to us all the time, every day. The golden threads are the times when the world is reaching out to us. And if you follow the golden threads, you find the, you know, what the poet Lorca called uh, the duende. You find the passion. You find the mythic realm. You find the transcendent. But nowadays, in this world that we live in, We've all bought, accepted, and consumed wholesale all these negative and limiting storylines about who and what we are. And so nowadays, the only people that follow the golden threads usually are children and artists. Sensitives and children. These are the people that follow the golden threads to the point that most people, after they start to grow up, they stop following the golden threads so much that they eventually also stop seeing them. They stop hearing them, they stop seeing them, they stop following the poetic impulses that led to tears in your eyes when you were 18, led you to a, a place where you had no choice but to whip out a, a notebook and, and scrawl poetry faster than you, it could come out and later on you can hardly read it. It's so illegibly full of energy and duende. And so this these golden threads, they're there for us all the time, every day. They're coming up. It's the, it's the places where you and the world start to become one. Where you start to let go of this idea that you're over here and it's over there. Where you start to let go of the idea that there are objects, which isn't true. There's only energy. There's only life. And you start to return to that state and you start to follow those golden threads 
And not only do they lead to your bliss and your happiness, but they lead to a connection and a state of wisdom and grace. And they are, they are the ways out of this jail yard of privation and suffering that belongs to me. See, they are the place, they are the way out. They are the enlightenment ultimately. That connection, all those connections. And we have to take those adventures. We have to begin to first see them. There's a story I like. This is a Sufi story. This student went to see a fakir, which is a wise man in the Sufi tradition. And he had a bad trip to get there. Wallet got stolen. Everything bad went wrong. And when he got there, he threw down his shoes and slammed the door and sat down. And the fakir said to him, I will teach you. But first I want you to go apologize to that door and those shoes. And the man said, that's stupid. Who apologizes to a door? And the fakir said, if the door is alive enough to receive your anger, it's alive enough to receive your apology. There's great power in that. And there's great insanity and recognizing the insanity. The insanity that even if the world were composed of stupid objects that are lifeless and not energy, why are all the negative emotions socially acceptable and all of the positive emo emotions not socially acceptable. In other words, if you're walking down the road and you see a man shouting at a cell phone, you don't think twice. You jerk, you piece of junk. But if you saw that same man saying, I love you, you would think him mad. So why is it socially acceptable for me to go around abusing this world? And it's not acceptable for me to go around loving it. If it's alive enough for me to be angry at it, it's alive enough for me to talk to it in love as well. And more importantly, it's just alive enough. That's the magic. The magic is, like I said, when you begin to shift this worldview and you begin to relate to things as though they are alive, as though they are energy, then you see that the communication starts to happen both ways. First with these golden threads that start coming every day, which if you follow them, if you're brave, you'll lead further and further into this place of, of awakened energy of everything being energy. And this is the place where plant medicine functions. And you can scientifically call it placebo. I don't mind. I don't know what percentage of the healing that I receive, spirit, mind, and body from tea is related to my participation and what part is related to the tea. You know, on the one hand, in the most basic way, I drink tea spiritually because I'm a spiritual person and I want to do everything spiritually. So whether it's tea or walking up the stairs, I want to do it in an awakened way with, a, with an open mind that's present and full of wisdom and compassion. So there's that. And I don't know the percentage to which it's about my participation and the percentage which it's about her. But I do know without a doubt in my mind, 100% absolutely guaranteed that she's out there, that she talks to me. I've been talking to her now for 20 years, more. That's a long time, every day. It's it, that she talks back, there's no doubt in my mind. To what extent I have to walk this way and empty my bowl, and to what extent she fills it, I don't know. I'm actually not interested in finding out. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's more on certain days and less on other days. Maybe it's more with certain teas and less with other teas. I can correlate both of those theories to my experience and probably other theories as well. I don't really know. But I do know that she's out there and she responds. And that's the magic of it, that there is a response, especially from this plant, because this plant is the, you know, she's the queen. The, one of the origin myths of tea is with this character we have over here, Shen Nong, who is the divine farmer. He ruled China for a thousand years and, uh, and you know, he was the, he's the founder of, of civilization. He's the founder of farming. That's why he's called divine farmer. He gave the people agriculture and civilization. He's also the founder of all medicinal herbs all Chinese medicine, which is the oldest medicine on this planet. So he's, so he is the founder of medicine itself. 
He represents all those things. What he really is, what he represents, is all of the collective wisdom of all the tribal chieftains and shamans of pre-civilized China, who of course gave civilization to China. And that he ruled a thousand years just means a really long time. In Chinese, 10,000 is everything. So a thousand is one-tenth of everything. It means a long time. And anyway, the story is, there's actually a few versions of the story. But one version of the story is he's meditating and the, and the leaf falls into his boiling water and he drinks it and exclaims those words which are on the scroll over there, which uh, are, this is the emperor of all medicinal herbs. This is the emperor of all medicinal herbs. There's no other herb as benign. There's no other herb as decidedly human. There is in fact no substance on this planet that has as much human consciousness devoted to it as tea. Even now today, it is the second most consumed substance on this planet. After water, next comes tea. And it has informed the entire geopolitical milieu of this world. There's an old saying in China that tea doesn't belong to China, China belongs to tea. It was the, econ it was the very economy and, and, and nature and essence of everything Chinese. Even the calendar. Spring began in China the first day the emperor sipped the first sip of the first flush of green tea. That was the official day of spring beginning. And it was the currency of the nation. It's the only thing that kept the barbarians in the north peaceful to any extent. A big wall that you can see from space didn't even work. But tea did. And then the entire British Empire was built on tea. And by extension America who achieved its independence by throwing tea in the water. So this, this whole world was, was built and shaped by it. But not only that, it, you know, it just has a tremendous amount of consciousness devoted to it. You can hone in on a little aspects of it and just stand back in awe. Like that there's a village in Japan where for hundreds of years, every father and son has spent every waking moment of every day carving bamboo whisks to whisk tea. And that's just one piece of teaware out of thousands in one tea tradition in one place. It doesn't include farming or, or drinking. So this, this, this is a plant that is very, very much decidedly human. And that to me is the, um, the essence of why, why this plant, why not other plants, is because uh, it's the emperor of all medicinal herbs. I feel like all the other plants, they ha even the plant teachers, because there are other plant teachers, but all of the other plants, even the plant teachers, they are their own, they, are, they, they evolve for their own reason. Scientifically, you could say they evolved to fill a niche in a local ecology. And the better they are at doing that, the more they did it in other ecologies. But this plant evolved only to be human. So it is our source, which is the plant kingdom. It is the plant kingdom's communication to us. Be and that's the leaf falling into the pot. That's the meaning of it. It's that that was the cell phone call of the plant kingdom, reaching out to us, becoming human. It's doing that anyway. So what I'm saying is this, and this is kind of summing up the whole topic we're talking about today very simply. I'll talk a little bit more, but, but right now we can summarize everything, which is that nature is always talking to us. T helps us to understand what she's saying. And that's what she is. She's the translator. She's the one that comes in and connects the others. See, the other plant teachers, you have to go to the plant kingdom. You know, good examples, things like ayahuasca. You take ayahuasca, she's a very powerful plant teacher, but you have to go into the plant kingdom. And it's alien in there. And when you come back, not all of those lessons that you got there are integratable into an ordinary everyday human life. You go in there and you come back and you're like, oh, okay, what does that mean? Some things are clear, some things are not. Was I hallucinating? What, what, you know, I mean, it's a hallucinogenic drug. So it also comes at this expense of, of attacks to our body and mind. But it also is a sense that not, the lessons are not so easily integratable from a lot of plants. This plant is very benign and she comes into our world so easily. She comes into the into the day-to-day -day awareness of human beings so easily. The British understood without any help from the Chinese that tea isn't just a beverage 
or an herb or a plant medicine. It's also a time. There's a time and space to set down your ego, set down your stuff and be with people you love and connect, to relax, to calm down. Everybody understands at least that, that all disease on this planet is either caused or compounded by stress. And so the more relaxation I cultivate in my life, the healthier I am, the more peaceful I am. And I have to have space for that in my life. So there's, there's some aspect to which everybody relates to it. That's why it's so predominant. I feel that um, for a lot of people, sadly, because the tea world is a pyramid, right? My teacher always says this, right? You have beverage, a hobby, art, and Tao. And then quite cutely, he always says that the top is a lonely place, but at least we have the best teas to keep us company. Because the quality of the tea moves up this pyramid as well. Obviously, the quality of the medicine. But if you invert it, if you invert this pyramid, you have a deeper understanding as well, which is an old Taoist saying. There's an old Taoist saying, because an inverted pyramid is kind of like a lake. And there's an old Taoist saying that the depths don't fear the surface. It's the surface that fears the depths. So I don't have any problem relating to tea as an art. I don't have any problem relating to it as a hobby. I'll geek out on teapots with you all day. I don't have any problem relating to it as a beverage, putting it in a thermos to go. It's a great beverage, much better for you than soda or coffee. I have no problem relating to it in any of those ways, but I haven't lost the connection to what's primary. I feel like that's just sad that a lot of that's been lost because people have been drinking tea for tens of thousands of years, at least 20,000 years. You think about that, it's a long time. It's long, back, back deep into our heritage, older than the pyramids, older than Buddha or Christ, very, very, very central to what it means to be human. And sadly, almost all the tea books that you go pick up in the bookstore nowadays skip over the first 18,500 years with a single sentence. Something to the effect of, for thousands of years, tea was medicine to Chinese people. And in that sentence, whoop, we're at the Tang Dynasty when tea was commoditized, culturalized, and made into a culture and a, and a practice and a, and a commodity to be bought and sold. And we're skipping over those 18,000 years of plant medicine. But it's time for that to come back. That's where my teachings primarily are. That's where the focus of this tradition primarily is, is bringing that back. It's not to say I mind any of what's of that culture or anything like that. It's to say that th that without the essence is hollow. And it's not so transformative. It's not so healing. Because you're missing the participation that's required to make plant medicine healing. You're missing that participation in the practice. You have to participate in it. And to participate in it, you have to be open. Just like if you're open... Right? There's a lineage that surrounds me, and it is Zen, and it's a direct non-verbal transmission. And if you show up to this center, and you come around here with that open, without the resistance, without any, I'm here and you're there. But as I'm a student, I'm open, I'm receptive, I'm humble, fill me. It comes and fills you. It's not I that fill you. If I'm filling you, then you're getting filled with gunk. Because I, the part of me that is I, is just the same gunk that's the part of you that is you. You don't need more of that gunk. you got enough of that gunk. Then we just rub on each other and make ego games, personality friction. You just become a cog in a, in a machine. You're not part of the actual lineage. Do you see? It's not, it's not flowing through you. This is what the word, the Sanskrit word guru actually means this. Guru is not a person. Guru is God in his aspect as teacher. Right? There's a part in the Bible like this. It's the, it's the part, it's right before the part where Jesus says that um, easier for a, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Just before that part where he says that, he says, like, good rabbi, may I, ha you know, may I ask you a question? And Jesus says, you know, essentially, uh, who are you calling good? I mean, don't call me good. There's no one good but God. God is the only good which is equivalent to what in Zen we say, right? There are no enlightened beings, only enlightened actions. So it's the same kind of spirit of, of, uh, of what Jesus is saying is that the part of me that is great, the part of me that is good is God, not me. 
And if you confuse the two, right? If you if you think that if you confuse the teacher and the and the and the Zen, if you confuse the uh, guru as a as a being and and the God that is coming through, you see you you're missing something. You're not understanding that you've only ever had one teacher in your life, right? But that that divinity has just had shown up in your life in many different ways, in books and in the faces of different people and situations, etc. And so you you're missing the point. You're not eating. You you're sitting around full and nothing's getting in, and then. Um, and then the relationship breaks down because if if the student isn't showing up like a student, then there's no learning, and then the teachers stop showing up. Right? There's an old saying in India, right? When the student is ready, the teacher appears. Ready means you show up, open and humble, and a teacher just appears right at that moment, bloop, and starts filling your bowl. And if you sit there with a full bowl, then you get no more tea. You have to drink it and digest it. So it doesn't matter how much food you have around you. It matters how much you can consume. You could live in Costco. Aisles and aisles of tons and tons of food, but it'll all just go rotten and bad if you can't eat it. And not just eat it, but digest it. Not just pass it through as waste, but actually become it. So you have to eat the energy, and you have to become the energy, and then you, you're shifted. And that's how plant medicine works too. It's not just a substance that I drink and it goes through me and then I pee it out. It's an energy that becomes me. And I let it in. I let it in body, heart, mind, and soul. I let the experience in. I let it fully in. It's not passing through me. I'm not just hanging out in this room and then leaving. Right? I am this room. I am this moment. And to a great extent, I am you. So this, this is how we participate. And if you're not ready to participate in all of life that way, then create a practice where you can participate in that space. And slowly, as you participate more and more, you will, you will see that it all starts to become tea. It all starts to become this practice, that the healing starts to spread, the healing starts to change. So this is where plant medicine begins. It begins with, with, a right, with the right intention which is to say the right view, the right intention, an intention of participating, an intention of not, I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to bring some tea to me and I'm going to taste it and put it back over there. But that I'm going to become this process, that I'm as natural a part of it as the water that made the tree grow, as the, as the soil and, for, and the natural minerals in the soil, as the sun. I'm as natural a part of this space as any other part that's the essence of zen if you look at zen gardening that's what zen gardening is all about zen gardening is about the understanding that if i come and hang out in this garden for six hours a day for let's say 20 years i went to a zen garden in la we did a big event there the men and women had been cultivating that garden for five six hours a day for like 38 years now if you think about it if a rabbit comes and eats down some of the grass, and because of that, the path moves like a meter over. Over the course of like five years, let's say the rabbits keep eating here, and the path moves like five meters that way. We would call that natural. That's a natural change of the garden changing itself. It's not an exterior force coming in and changing the garden. It's the garden changing from within. Now, if the person hangs out in the garden six hours a day for many, many years, and if they are good Zen gardener, and they let the garden in, then they become the garden. And any changes that they make to the garden are as natural as the changes that the rabbit makes. Because they are a natural animal and they are a part of that garden. Do you see? They are the garden. They're not someone who comes into the garden and manipulates it from the outside. They are it. That's the, that's the shift in worldview. We are this earth. Right? I often test people. I ask them, right? I want you to stand up and go touch the nearest earth. And everybody always fails. They touch the ground, they touch the plants, they touch other things. And I would say like the, this teaching is to show you that, you know, when someone asks you to touch the nearest earth, you touch this. Because we grew out of the earth, we are the earth, we are this planet. We are not visitors who bounce around in here and leave. We are this place. You are the place where you are. 
And when you let that in like that, then there's connection, then there's harmony with actually with truth, with reality. And there's a receptivity that starts to flow. And this is the basis of plant medicine and working with a plant spirit. This is the basis of um, cultivating oneself through tea. It, there are other tools that come then later on. There are other aspects to this, right? And it doesn't have to be the focus of every tea session. As I said, I don't mind tea as hobby, as art, as beverage. I don't mind any of those things. Sometimes tea's in the background and the focus is connection with other people. It doesn't matter. But this aspect of participating, of showing up with the right intention, with an open heart, that's receptive to communication between the plant kingdom and myself. Right? That receptivity. Even if the communication has never happened yet for you, and you don't have any experience of that yet, in other words, she has not spoken to you yet, so you don't have any experience of, of receiving communication, you still have to, for it to start, you're going to have to show up with a mind that's at least open enough to the, open enough to the possibility that that communication can begin. It's not going to be in English. It's a different kind of communication. It's an energetic communication. It's a vibrational communication, right? So if, if by intelligence you mean an ability to rationally think and speak English, then yes, this board is stupid, right? But the stuff in the board, the stuff in the stones is the same stuff in me. It's just organized differently. So it's, the, it's, it's vibrations is the way that we can communicate. Energy, right? The energy of this can flow into me. I mean, in a really obvious way, if I hit it, sound travels through it, and the sound vibrates through it, and then vibrates through me, and in that way we're connected. Right now I'm inside of you. My voice, wind is passing through here and vibrating and coming, and it goes going into your brain and jangling the vibrations of you. So there is those basic ways that we are that we are connected, but more than that, this, this communication is happening. And those golden threads are happening. And so the golden threads, the nature, it's speaking all the time. This medicine helps us to understand what it's saying. It helps us to learn that language again, because it's not really a learning as much as it is a returning. Lao Tzu says that in the Tao Te Ching, right? The way, the Tao is a returning. It's not a it's not a movement towards adding something. That in fact is another difference between an ordinary teacher and a spiritual teacher. The ordinary teacher is there to add something to you, to add some knowledge to you, to add some information to you. The spiritual teacher actually is to help you take something away. This is why when I go out and speak, often what happens a lot in Australia recently, Sam and I had this experience like 10, 15 times. People come up afterwards and they say, Oh, all those things you were saying. You were just putting words to stuff I already know. I just never said it like that. But I've been thinking all those things you said. I've been thinking like that for a long time now. That's the point, is that my job and my goal is not to convince anyone of anything. That's a really strong waste of energy to try to convince the mind. The mind is a fickle thing anyway. Even if you convince it, you'll just have to reconvince it three days later. And then you'll spend all your time convincing and reconvincing egos. That's not, it's a pointless endeavor. When the student is ready, then the teachings make sense. And it makes sense because it was already in you. It resonates with you because you already are it. And something has just been removed. A veil has been removed and you realize, oh, those things he's saying, they're inside of me already. I know that. I am that. And those uh, seeds, you could say, get activated by that vibration of, those, of the sound. And then the seeds start to grow. And there's something, you know, karmic in that. You know, this person can say it and, it, and the seeds don't activate. And then another person says it, and the seeds activate. And they're actually saying the same thing. So it's not just about the, what was said. It's about the vibration of, of how it was said that actually causes the seeds to activate. But the seeds are kind of already in us. We all have God seeds in us that can grow up into... God trees that bear God fruit and basically return to God. Return us to God. So this is the this is the most basic aspect 
of a tea practice, the most fundamental is just this approach, an approach that is primarily based on, on a on, on a relationship between my myself and my tea practice, in which I am my tea practice, a relationship in which I'm going to become the thing. I'm not going to do it from over here. I'm going to be it. And when you are it, that's when the shifts happen. And that goes for any art, not just tea. Tea is a special plant, but it goes for any art, right? If you apprentice with someone and pay attention to the verbs, there are people who are, there's a guy who is a cabinet maker, and there are people who make cabinets. You can make cabinets for all kinds of reasons. You can make cabinets for money. But when you are a cabinet maker, then that's what you are. And if you apprentice with someone who is a cabinet maker, then you will find that in their cabinet making is also included A, an approach to how to live a human life, and B, an approach to the world in which that life is lived. Those things will be included in being a cabinet maker. In other words, by becoming a cabinet maker, he developed a way of living and an approach to the life in which that world is lived in. And that's what this center is about. You have here, you know, to start out with a person, but then there slowly over the years has accumulated people. So it's not just woo, it's a group of people, but it started with my lifestyle. It started with a lifestyle in which I was a chajin, I was a person of tea. And that lifestyle includes an approach to how to live and an approach to the world in which that life is lived in. And I was just living it. And then people were attracted and now there's a whole group of us here living that life. And that life that we live, that is the lesson of this place. That's it. It's not in the discourses. It's in the way that we live. Because this is the way that we live. This isn't an act that we do on Saturdays and Tuesdays. We live this way, day in and day out, the people that live here. We live this way. This is our life, right? For you, it's a, an experience. For us, it's our life. Do you understand? We live this way. And so this way of life is the teaching, really. This way of being, that's the teaching. And if you're missing that, you're missing the point of this place. So when you come here, if you open, right, then this way of life can impact you and affect you and affect the way that you see things and affect how you then go home and live your life. We see that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. But in order to do so, you have to come and open yourself and participate in this way of life fully. Not just bodily, but fully participate. And when you participate, then it comes in and it changes the way that you live. This way of life that we're practicing.